It's a surprising truth that we know far more about our cosmic neighborhood than we do about the oceans on our own planet. It wasn't until relatively recently, in the 1950s, that scientists used sonar to map the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean for the first time. And when they did, they found something totally unexpected. A ridge of underwater mountains that was the focus of near constant seismic and volcanic activity. The discovery of this mid-Atlantic ridge ended up being a pivotal piece of evidence to support the theory of continental drift. It showed that since the Triassic period, around 230 million years ago, the Atlantic Ocean had been growing, opening up from this immense seam in the middle. But it appears that's not the whole story. Because while vast ocean ridges tell us that the Atlantic is opening now, trilobite fossils, smaller than the palm of your hand, hint that this whole thing has happened before. And so, this is the hundred-year tale of how an unlikely bunch of bottom-dwelling marine critters helped reveal that ocean basins are basically reincarnated every few hundred million years. The story of this discovery begins in Newfoundland in 1888. Paleontologist Charles Doolittle Walcott was preoccupied with some of the earliest fossils known at this time, dating to the Cambrian period around 520 million years ago. He would later become famous for discovering the exceptionally preserved Burgess Shale biota, which would reveal the Cambrian explosion of animal life in all its glory. But that was still two decades in his future. In 1888, Walcott visited Newfoundland to map out the distribution of different species of trilobites. These common Cambrian arthropods had paleontologists of the time excited because their great number and diversity meant that they could be used as a geological tool, relatively dating and correlating rock strata across vast distances. But Walcott found something strange on the Canadian island. The shallow water trilobites in eastern Newfoundland are very different from those in the west. Eastern populations were dominated by paradoxidids, for example, while olnelids were more common to the western side of the island. Now, this was unexpected because shallow water environments existing so close to each other at the same time should have allowed plenty of mixing and mingling among the trilobites. So the two populations of fossils should look the same. But this wasn't what Walcott found. Instead, he described the two geographically distinct fossil communities, which also included other Cambrian fossils like brachiopods and graptolites, which became known as the Atlantic and Pacific faunas, separated by a straight line right through the middle of Newfoundland. And this wasn't the only place that geologists found these disparate shallow water faunas butted up against each other. After decades of further exploration and mapping, paleontologists found so-called Atlantic fossil communities in England and Wales right next to the so-called Pacific communities in Scotland and Northern Ireland. There were Pacific fossils west of Spitsbergen, part of the Svalbard archipelago in the Arctic Ocean. But none of these fossils were found in rocks of the same age on the west side of the island. And while places like New Brunswick, Canada hosted Atlantic faunas, its next door neighbors of Maine and Quebec contained only Pacific fossils. There was no easy explanation for this distribution, especially early on when geologists and paleontologists assumed that the continents have always been in pretty much the same place as they are today. So scientists imagine that there must have been a vast underwater chasm through the middle of Newfoundland that has since somehow disappeared or been filled in to explain why the two apparently adjacent communities couldn't commune. But the tide began to turn in the early 20th century, with the rise of a radical new theory of continental drift. Proposed in 1912 by Alfred Wegener, the theory was based on the idea that North America and Europe, as well as South America and Africa, are like pairs of puzzle pieces separated by the Atlantic. But despite the obvious geometric evidence, continental drift was rejected by the scientific community for many years. This was mainly because nobody could think of a way to explain how the continents had become separated in the first place. And so, in the 1940s, Canadian geologist John Tuzo Wilson revisited the Newfoundland trilobite puzzle with the still largely rejected ideas of continental drift in mind. Even Wilson was skeptical. But he examined the lines separating Newfoundland's Atlantic and Pacific faunas and found metamorphic and volcanic rocks that had been mangled and crushed. He realized this was a sure sign of an immense continental collision. 
The reason that the two faunas were so different was because they had inhabited completely different coastlines, separated by a deep and uncrossable ocean that has since closed and disappeared. Charting the fossil communities through time seems to support this conclusion as well. During the Cambrian, the Atlantic and Pacific faunas were very distinct from one another. But as the millennia passed by the Ordovician period, the two fossil groups had become more similar to each other. Then later, in the Silurian period, they appeared even more similar. And this suggests that there was more mixing and mingling between the shallow water communities as time went on, which is possible if the two opposing sides drifted closer to each other. Wilson continued to chart the geological evidence for continental collision all over the Northern Hemisphere, in Spitsbergen, Scandinavia, the British Isles, and from Maine to Connecticut. These zones of mangled rock form what's now known as the Iapetus Suture, which is all that's left of the ancient trilobite-separating Iapetus Ocean. What's weird, though, is that this Iapetus Suture, representing the closure of the ancient ocean, more or less follows the same line along which the modern-day Atlantic Ocean opened. Walcott's fossil puzzles on either side of the Atlantic today are basically places where bits of the ancient continents got stuck on the wrong side of the line when the Atlantic started to form. So in 1966, Wilson was the first to wonder whether the Atlantic Ocean had in fact closed and then reopened. In the half century since, the foundation that Wilson laid has been developed into one of the core theories of plate tectonics, known as the Wilson cycle, which essentially describes how ocean basins tend to close and then reopen along the same collisional boundaries, as opposed to the assembled continents shattering in new ways every time. There are eight main stages to this cyclic tectonism, and we see various places around the globe exhibiting some of these stages. First, extension within a continent creates what's known as a sag basin in the crust. It's a literal dip in the continental crust like you get when you pull apart toffee. The oil-producing West Siberian Basin is an example of this. Extension continues until the continent begins to rift, eventually allowing seawater to flow in and an embryonic ocean to form. This is what's happening today in the Rift Valley of Eastern Africa, where geologists predict the continent will flood and become an ocean in the next 5 to 10 million years. Not very long in geologic time. Next, seafloor spreading will expand the rift into a young new ocean, like the Red Sea today. Spreading continues, and the two halves of the original continent drift apart, creating a large, mature ocean. This is actually the state that we find the Atlantic Ocean in currently. At some point, when the basin is large enough or the tectonic forces shift, a subduction zone forms in at least one edge of the ocean basin. This is what we find around the ring of fire that surrounds the modern-day Pacific Ocean. Once the subduction zone is formed, the ocean basin switches from growing to shrinking, and the continents move closer together as the oceanic crust is subducted into the mantle. We can see this process happening today in the Mediterranean Sea, with subduction beneath Greece and Turkey or in Seattle. Come take my class. Eventually, the ocean basin closes completely and the continents collide, leaving only a crushed and mangled suture zone. At first, the suture zone often looks like a mountain range, like the Himalayas. But over time, the mountains get worn down, exposing the metamorphic and igneous rocks at the surface. Finally, after colliding and essentially welding themselves together, the newly assembled continent enjoys a period of stability, before the cycle begins all over again with extension and rifting. But why do new ocean basins end up opening at the suture zones rather than somewhere else in the continent? With plate tectonics, the spreading or extension of plates is partially driven from underneath by hot mantle material upwelling and spreading out when it hits the bottom of the crust. On a global scale, this upwelling tends to happen underneath old ocean sutures in the middle of continents because subduction and downwelling is happening at the edges of those continents. What goes down must eventually come back up, so the hot excess mantle is pushed up in the middle. Then, the sutures themselves represent areas of weakness in the crust where the rocks are already messed up. So with a little encouragement from underneath, they're the first place the crust is going to give out. All of this is linked to the idea of supercontinent assembly and breakup that we've talked about on eons before. But the Wilson cycles of ocean birth and death tend to happen on a smaller geographic scale and a shorter geological timescale. 
Today, the Atlantic Ocean exploiting the old Iapetus suture is the most obvious example, but there are places at different stages of their Wilson cycles where we can find evidence of the old ocean basins that are being reincarnated. For instance, the Rio Grande Rift runs north-south through Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas. It's in its pre-ocean extension phase, but it's following an ancient suture where the now-disappeared Farallon Plate, once part of the Pacific Ocean, basically scraped itself to death against the edge of North America. Also, in northeastern China, a rift system is opening along the Trans-North China origin, which formed nearly two billion years ago when two ancient oceans closed. And as I mentioned before, the Rift Valley in eastern Africa is a mere five to 10 million years away from becoming an ocean. And it's forming along the line of the East African origin, which marks where the Mozambique Ocean was back in the late Precambrian 720 million years ago. When Wilson solved the mystery of the misplaced trilobites, his theory helped to turn the tide for continental drift theory. Today, the Wilson cycle is fundamental to our understanding of how plate tectonics works. It would be natural to imagine that when continents collide, the mountains that form would make the boundaries stronger and less likely to break. After all, when welding metal, the weld itself can be stronger than the original material. But Wilson cycles show that's not the case. These folded and faulted zones of rock are actually weaker and more likely to break under pressure. As a result, the same plate boundaries are preserved for hundreds of millions of years, meaning that except for a little give and take at the edges, many continental interiors have stayed the same for billions of years. And using this knowledge of cyclical tectonics, we can look to the past and predict what oceans might exist in the far future. But recognizing the life cycles of oceans on our planet does more than just help us map the future and the past. It also helps scientists understand how tides, ocean circulation, and climate have changed over millions of years, all of which have the potential to guide the evolution of life. On the shores of the ancient Iapetus, it was the trilobites who felt the waves of the Wilson cycle. And before long, it will be the disparate inhabitants of the Atlantic too. Now that we know the Mid-Atlantic Ridge basically formed along the line of an old tectonic suture, check out our episode when the Atlantic Rift opened a supercontinent to learn more about how the Atlantic Ocean was created. Oceans of thanks to this month's eontologists. Addie, Annie and Eric Higgins, Carl Wolfel, Jackie Scott Ralston, Jake Hart, John Davidson Ng, Juan M, Melanie Lamb Carnival, Nico Robin, Raphael Haas, and Steve. Become an Eonite at patreon.com slash eons and you can get fun perks like access to a monthly digital paleo art puzzle. And as always, thanks for joining me in the Ken Barnes studio. Subscribe at youtube.com slash eons for more tectonic tales. Walcott's fossil puzzles on either side of the Atlantic today. I have no idea what I just read. I said words. I said words. I was detached. I think it sounded right though. Wonderful. Okay. You don't know. Unless you're watching the bloopers, then know that Walcott's fossil puzzles. Walcott's fossil fossil puzzles. Walcott's fossil. Walcott's fossil. Walcott's. Walcott's fossil. Walcott's fossil. <laughs> Nearly yeah, broke yeah. me this morning. Walcott's fossil puzzle. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Oh, it's working. Yeah, yeah. I'm laughing so hard.